What does it mean to be called crazy in a crazy world? Listen to Madness Radio, Voices and Visions from Outside Mental Health. Tuesdays, 4 to 5 p.m. Eastern, on Pacifica Affiliates, WXOJLPFM, Northampton, Massachusetts, and KWMD in Kasilof and Anchorage, Alaska. Produced by Freedom Center and the Icarus Project, streaming, podcasting, and archived at madnessradio.net. Welcome to Madness Radio. This is your host, Will Hall. Today, our guest is Anne Fletcher. She is the author of seven books, including Thin for Life and Sober for Good. We are speaking with her about recovery from alcohol abuse and serious uh, drinking problems. And thanks a lot for joining us today on the show, Anne Fletcher. Good to be with you, Will. Now, your book, Sober for Good, I know that you've written a number of other books on um, weight loss confidential. You're doing very interesting work around um teens and um, eating problems and, and losing weight. And um, your your book, Sober for Good, interested me because I, I really liked the approach to the diversity of different ways of uh, alcohol problems and, and drinking problems and not just the what we hear about all the time of AA and 12 steps, although that's very valuable for people, but really looking at all the different ways that people um, can recover. And um, so it's great to have you on the show. And tell us about how you got interested in writing Sober for Good. Well, it goes back to my early days professionally, um, and not far from where you're located geographically. Um, I I actually have a master's degree in nutrition science. I'm a registered dietitian by training. And early in my career, I worked clinically in an obesity clinic um, in Worcester, Massachusetts, and um, helped overweight people lose weight. And I learned there that one size does not fit all. You know, what works for one person for weight loss doesn't work for the next person. And, um, and I also got very interested in the sub- subject or, or, or the, the subject of change and what motivates a person in the first place. How do people maintain change over the long haul? And I really watched a lot of people lose weight, but I watched most of them gain it back. And I got really interested in the subject of maintenance, maintenance of behavior change. And I happened to know people in my own personal life who had lost weight and kept it off. And then I started keeping track of scientific studies on people who who had succeeded at keeping the weight off and became very intrigued with the subject. And... Time went on, and I eventually became a writer and um, went from writing newsletters to writing books. And my, um, one of my first books was Thin for Life, which was about adults who lost weight and kept it off. So I wrote a series of books, um, the Thin for Life books, um, which are about more than 200 adults who lost weight and kept it off. And I kind of developed this... Um, oh, it's not a formula, but my, my, my trademark in writing books is going out and finding hundreds of people who have succeeded at overcoming a problem and also looking at the scientific literature and talking to experts in the field to look at what works for maintaining behavior change in overcoming that particular problem. And um, because of some of my own personal struggles with alcohol, I was also interested in the subject of recovery. And I convinced my editor at Houghton Mifflin to let me apply that same model to sobriety um, because I just decided that after writing three books on weight maintenance that it was time to switch gears and do something else. So I convinced her to let me write Sober for Good. So I went out and found more than 200 people who had overcome drinking problems in many different ways. And, and personally, I, I had tried a lot of different things to um, deal with my own problem drinking and um, had gone to AA meetings and um, read a lot of different books, Rational Recovery, and, um, and you know, realized that there was more than one way to do this, just as there is for people overcoming weight problems. So I ended up finding, I actually heard from 500 people, more than 500 people when I was recruiting people for Sober for Good. I couldn't include all of them in the book, but I I included about close to half of them. 
and I had 97 people who had recovered the, the what I call the traditional way, the 12-step way, and 125 people who had done it, done it a non-traditional way without going to AA. So, Anne, when you say drinking problem, let's talk about what that is because, you know, that's not always clear to really pin that down, and different people have different experiences. I, I do know that, um, and I want to just read something from a, uh, an article called The Drinking Dilemma that was in um, U.S. News and World Report uh, from uh, uh, several years ago. But it says that the misuse of alcohol costs the nation um, more than $100 billion a year in quantifiable costs, um, that alcohol figures in 41% of traffic crash fatalities, alcohol is a figure in 50% of homicides, 30% of suicides, and 30% of all accidental deaths in the U.S. So we're talking about something that has a huge impact health-wise and economically, but what's your sense of, of what, it, what, a health, what a problem with alcohol is? When does alcohol become a problem for someone, and when did it become a problem for you? Well, there are, you know, there are definitions of alcohol abuse and alcohol dependence that psychologists, addiction treatment professionals use. I don't have those committed to memory, um, but you can look them up online. But for the most part, and it's different, you know, you can't really go by how much you drink. It's what alcohol does to you. And what I go back to, you know, talking to the people who, you know, the definition, what, what I, when I was looking for people to include in my book, I asked, do you have a serious drinking problem? I avoid using the word alcoholic because it's loaded with, it's pejorative, it's loaded with connotations. And it gets in the way, there's actually research showing that it gets in the way of people doing something about a drinking problem. Oh, I'm not an alcoholic. Um, you know, it's basically people said to me over and over again, I realized that alcohol was causing problems in my life. Um, you know, for years I argued with my husband. I said, you know, I've got a serious drinking problem. I'm an alcoholic. And he said, no, you're not an alcoholic. You're not an alcoholic. Look, here's the definitions. You're not an alcoholic. And I finally said, you know what? It doesn't matter what we call it. I have a problem. It doesn't matter. I have a problem. I'm forgetting things. I have stomach aches, whatever it is. I'm not, it makes me feel depressed. And it's coming back to, is it causing problems in your life? And so what I went, did was, I went to the people in my book, who I call the masters of their drinking problems, and I said, what were some of the warning signs that you had, or what were some of the things that you would suggest to other people let you know that you have a drinking problem. And here's some of the things. I have them on, on page 32 and 33 of my book. A wake-up call, questions from the masters. Do you drink to get drunk or at least catch a buzz every time? I won't read them all, but do you use alcohol as an escape from life and its problems? Do you notice that you drink more than others? That was one of the things I noticed, that typically I would drink more than other people when I was out socially. Do you consistently drink more than you intended? Do you feel that something is missing when you face the thought of going for a day or going to a party or someplace without having a drink? Are you unable to drink just one? Um, do you repeatedly have pain in your life caused by alcohol but you continue to drink? Do you ever feel that you would be more loving if you did not use alcohol? These are some of the things that people in the book said. Does drinking depress you? Are you tired of regretting your actions and is alcohol related to that? Have you ever avoided taking a medication because you can't drink while taking it? Do you have a huge hole in your spirit that you are trying to fill, and you fill it with alcohol? Um, so um, does alcohol give you courage to say outrageous things? You know, these are, uh, there's a whole list that goes on and on. Um, and, you know, I thought, again, it's, you know, go to the people. This is what I've always done is go to the people who have the pro had the problem, who have overcome the problem, and see what they have to say. So it's a very subjective um, question about how it's impacting your life. And I mean, some people may... Yes, as I said, there, you know, if you're worried that you have a problem, I would encourage people to go to a professional and have a professional assessment done. Um, but I think, you know, these, I've had some people who were worried just read this list of questions and they go, oh, wow. Because a lot of people are afraid to go to a professional, you know, and, and this is, you know, really, it's been a wake-up call for them. And some people will will do something about it just by kind of connecting with people who who have had the problem themselves. So but I do urge people to get professional help if they are concerned. 
Now, the direction that most people go in is to AA and 12-step programs. And I think, you know, that definitely is helpful for a lot of people. But um, you, you mentioned that the book is really about the diversity of all the different experiences that people have. So why is it that um, you don't want to necessarily define yourself as an alcoholic or talk specifically about alcoholism or alcohol as a disease and the kinds of things that AA thinks in terms of? It's not It's not that you don't want to. It's a matter of finding what works for you. And again, I went to, it, you know, and I don't advise one way or the other. I, I, I go, I went to the people in the book and I said, what helped you? What works for you? And I said, so do you see yourself as an alcoholic? And some people said yes, and some people said no. I personally don't find that helpful. I don't find that label to be helpful for me. So it's a question of whether or not it helps you personally. So, you know, that, that, you know, what I encourage people to do is try things on for size. You know, if you think you have a drinking problem or you know you have a drinking problem, try AA, but try other things too. Um, and if you try AA, don't just go to one meeting. Different meetings and different kinds of meetings have different personalities. Um, and there's different kinds of AA meetings. There's discussion groups, there's, there's big book meetings, there's big open meetings, there's small meetings. Um, so, um, you know, but try, um, there's, there's lots of different kinds of recovery um, programs, and they're all addressed in Sober for Good, that are not based on the 12-step philosophy that, n- that you're off- people are not often not told about. Smart Recovery, S-M-A-R-T, that stands for Self-Management and Recovery Training, has more than 300 groups nationwide, um, and also all of these programs, including AA, have very strong online communities. If you can't find one of these face-to-face groups in your community, you might join an online group. Um, But Smart Recovery is not based on the disease concept at all. They don't use the term alcoholic. It's based on cognitive behavioral principles um, that are um, well-founded in the scientific literature. Um, And so smart recovery is an alternative with, as I said, more than 300 face-to-face groups nationwide. They're also in um, some prisons. Um, What else is there? Um, Women for Sobriety has a very different philosophy from AA. Um, Some people I interviewed went to both AA and Women for Sobriety or um, AA and Secular Organizations for Sobriety. That's another group that has hundreds of meetings nationwide. Life Ring Sobriety, which has the same philosophy as Secular Organizations for Sobriety. Again, nothing like AA. Um, And there's a description of all of these programs in my book. But also, one of the things that people are rarely told is that many people overcome drinking problems completely on their own. Um, Our outgoing president is a perfect example of this. Um, I hear from people all the time who recognize that alcohol was causing problems in their life, as George Bush did. Um, As far as we know, he never saw a chemical dependency counselor, never went to a treatment program, never went to an AA meeting, but he saw that alcohol was causing problems in his life, and he quit drinking on his own. I had about 25 people in Sober for Good who quit on their own. I think he writes about um, religion being really important yes. in his in yep. his recovery. Yep. And I think that we, you know, you I, and I did have a couple of people who who said that religion, um, separate from AA, because AA is a spiritual program, and actually eight higher courts have ruled that AA is a religious program. Um, so um, even though they say they're not religious and it's a spiritual program, eight higher courts have ruled that it is a religious program. Um, and I'm digressing here, but um, for that reason. Um, it's against the law to sentence prisoners, to mandate prisoners to go to 12-step programs. They have to be offered a choice of a secular program as well. Is, is that nationwide, that they have to be offered alternatives as well? Well, since higher courts have ruled that, it's my understanding that it is nationwide, but it still goes on all the time, and I think a lot of people don't know it or they're not empowered to challenge it. Yeah, I think it's really important to offer a a range of different things because one size does not fit all. Do you think that the effectiveness of AA, and clearly it it works for a lot of people, but do you think that it's, it's exaggerated, that it's kind of seen as the one and only way 
to go. And so the courts and medical professionals and society tends to rely on AA as the answer too much? Well, first, let me say there's no question that AA has saved count, countless lives. I mean, you know, there's there's no question that it helps a lot of people. Um, and, you know, AA is everywhere. I mean, there's AA in every community, every place that you go. So Inter- internationally, I think that, even, AA is all over the world. internationally, yep. And so one of the reasons why it's used so much is that it's everywhere. I mean, so many places, it's... You know, even if you have an inpatient program that's not 12-step based, and I'm going to come back to that in a minute, many times the only aftercare you can find for a patient is 12-step meetings. You know, people often need support, usually need support, after they come out of treatment, and the only aftercare you can find is going to be 12-step meetings. And so that's, you know, it's... And it may be very different philosophy than they were exposed to in treatment. So, you know, AA is everywhere. And so one of the sayings often at AA meetings is, okay, so take what you need and throw away the rest. Um, And, you know, go for the support and you don't have to buy everything that goes on at the AA meeting. Um, One of the issues is, you know, but the philosophy, what I heard over and over again is, you know, I told you I had 97 AA success stories in my book. So my book is not anti-AA. Um, but I also heard, so I heard from many people whose lives were saved by AA. But I also heard from many people who said, I wasn't able to recover until I learned that I could do it without AA. I was told over and over again that something was wrong with me because I didn't connect with AA. But when I finally realized that it was okay for me to not buy into the 12 steps, then I was able to, to do it. Or, you know, or I found another approach. I found smart recovery or I found rational recovery. Um, and then that philosophy worked for me. That I connected with better. Then I was able to get sober. Um, but one of the problems is that when I wrote Sober for Good, 93% of treatment programs. Now, there's a distinction here. Um, There are thousands and thousands, I don't have the number committed to memory, of AA meetings across the country. Now, those are self-help meetings. Um, Smart recovery, those are self-help meetings. Separate from that, we have drug and alcohol treatment programs, rehab, inpatient and outpatient. So those are separate. Those are things that you pay for or your insurance company pays for where you go for X amount of time. Um, you know, the, the classic was the 28 to 30 day model, which is changing now. But anyway, um, 93% of programs when I wrote Sober for Good were based on the 12 steps of AA. Now that has decreased somewhat since 2001 when my book came out. But it's still the vast majority of treatment programs are based on the 12 steps. I think also that that's internationally is different, that other countries I I had read about, Canada, for example, haven't been relying so much exclusively on AA as the U.S. has. I believe that that's true. I think that it's it's still fairly heavily AA-based, but not to the extent that that, that the United States is. I think you're correct about that. But but anyway, so the difficulty is that it you know it's it's hard for somebody to find treatment that's not twelve step based, um, and much of treatment is provided by people who are in recovery, who went through twelve step programs themselves. Um, so it's you know it's and people I I've been interviewing people for a new book that I'm working on on drug and alcohol rehab. And sometimes they're told that they failed the program because they don't they don't connect with the twelve steps, which is a sad thing, you know, because sometimes drug and alcohol treatment professionals don't realize or don't accept the fact that people can do it in other ways. Now, one of the things that a lot of people find helpful about AA is this idea of alcoholism as a disease. I'm an alcoholic, and once I admit that and acknowledge that, then that's the key, that's the fundamental um, prerequisite to, um, to recovery. And you're suggesting that that's actually not, that's actually not the requirement, that, that that's actually not true. So let's, let's talk about that, because that is a message that we get 
a lot that this is a disease, it's genetic, and that's just all there is to it, and you just have to admit it and then just stop drinking forever. I asked people what was helpful to them or how did they perceive it. So it's not what I say or what I think is true. In, in Sober for Good, it's what I asked them to, what did they believe, what did they find to be helpful. And I found that some people felt that it was a disease and some people did not. And I actually did not personally take a position on it in the book. Um, I, and what I, what I say is that not every expert subscribes to the disease model. Um, personally, I guess if you pressed me, I would say that I'm somewhat ambivalent about it. Since I wrote Sober for Good, I would say that more support has come out for a genetic basis for, um, for drug and alcohol addiction. Um, I, we cannot say that it's, you know, I think that some people inherit a lot of genes for addiction, just as is the case for obesity, and some people inherit not a lot. I mean, I'm saying this in a very simplistic way. You know, some of us acquire a lot of genes for, I'll say that again, some of us acquire a lot of genes for addiction. Some of us acquire a, a moderate amount of genes for addiction or obesity, and some of us don't acquire many at all. I mean, there's, you know, somebody joked to me recently, you know, everybody in my family seems to have an addiction but me, and believe me, it was not for lack of trying. For some reason, that one person in the family, even though he drank a lot, just didn't seem to have, you know, it didn't, it didn't happen to him. Um, so, but I do think that there is a genetic basis. I do think that there is, but it also has a very strong behavioral component as well. So, Anyway, but you know, diff- so, uh, but I don't think that it, it helps to to focus on it or to blame that. Um, so anyway, you know, I, I, it comes back to what helps you, what what wor- what works for you. Me personally, it doesn't help to keep focusing on. Oh, I have a disease. I'm powerless. Um, but it helps some people to do that. And but then to move on. Yeah, I think the difficulty is when when we start making claims that science has proven that it's a disease or that it's proven that there's genetic causes. I mean, even when things do run in family, there's a huge amount of learning that can come in family. Absolutely. Poverty and yes. child abuse come yes. through families as well, and they're not necessarily genetically um, caused. One of the key differences in what you're saying is that not everyone has to completely abstain and stop drinking that for some people absolutely that approach may be the best it depends on what works for you but what about people who would be concerned about this message of moderate drinking that it might for some people be okay to just reduce or get your drinking a little bit under control but not necessarily eliminate it completely well, let me go back to tell you, telling you what I found in Sober for Good. I found in Sober for Good what's been fairly well documented in the literature. I found that about one out of ten of my subjects, my people in Sober for Good, were able to drink upon occasion. Um, now, I, I would have to check my figures because I don't have them completely committed to memory, but I had, I'm trying to remember here, um, I had, I, they were about one in ten people. I think I only had six people who were, yes, six people who were true moderate drinkers, consuming alcohol more than once a week, but not in a problematic way. Well, another four were occasional drinkers who had alcohol no more than once a week, so the, the others drank it a little more often. The remaining ten were near abstinent, meaning that on rare occasions they might have a sip or a small amount to drink which, of course, would be totally forbidden in AA. Um, Fifteen of these 20, so there were 20 out of 222, sometime drinkers or sippers have at least 10 years of sobriety. So basically, um, that's what the literature shows, that out of about one of, out of 10 former uh, problem drinkers are able to drink moderately. That was shown in a large Harvard study um, by George Valiant in which he followed problem drinkers or serious problem drinkers over time. But what I stress in Sober for Good is that 9 out of 10 people have made a profound commitment to abstinence. Most people with serious drinking problems find that it's just easier to not drink. Okay, so I want to stress that right up front. 
Um, that, that's, I have you know, to say that's also feel... been my experience of people that I know, and I've, I haven't really had a serious drinking problem, but I know that just health-wise, it just really works for me to just really stay away completely. Yeah. But I think it's important, to, to, as you're recognizing, to not see it as an absolute everyone is going to have that same experience. Right, right. They feel, and a lot of people feel that you're just playing with fire. But again, I'm reporting what I found. I'm not recommending it. I'm not encouraging it. But it, what I tell people to do is, well, let, let me tell you that this is what the literature suggests. The people who are successful with moderate drinking tend to have the following characteristics. They're psychologically stable. This is what the studies show. They're well-educated. They're steadily employed. They don't regard themselves as alcoholic or problem drinkers in general. This is what, you know, they, they don't subscribe to the disease concept of alcohol problems. They believe controlled drinking is possible, and they develop alternatives to drinking as a means of coping with stress. What I tell people who recognize that they have issues with alcohol, but who would like to try moderate drinking to do is to go see an expert, and I give resources in the appendix of Sober for Good, have a good comprehensive alcohol assessment with a professional who knows what they're doing, um, or and or go to moderation management website because that's a self-help group for people, um, but going the professional route would be preferred. Um, to, you know, work with a professional who has some experience with this and knows how to give you an assessment to see if you're a candidate for this. So it sounds like it's important to be pretty skeptical of the moderate approach just based on the people that you've um, interviewed and what the literature is saying, but to not rule it out. Right. And I can, there also is a book by Dr. William Miller on moderate drinking, which is excellent. He's one of the, um, it's called Controlling Your Drinking. Um, he's um, a leading expert um, who is now retired, but he was at the University of New Mexico. It's called Controlling Your Drinking by William Miller. Um, there's another one by Dr. Fred Rogers, R-O-T. It's called Responsible Drinking. Um, by Dr. F uh, Dr. R O T G E R S. Um, he's the first author called Responsible Drinking. Those are both excellent guides by respected PhD level psychologists. And how many people drink alcohol and just don't have a problem with it? Um, I believe that the figures would be nine nine out of ten, roughly. So the vast majority of people are able to drink without a problem. And I think one of the things that's difficult about recovery from alcohol or any substance is that, you know, if you change and you need to stop using alcohol or using a substance and then you're surrounded by those 9 out of 10 people who don't have an alcohol problem, it gets to be really difficult because, you know, how do you socialize, go to parties, go out, go to restaurants, go to bars. And so that's where I think the self-help communities can be helpful to find people. And I, I think the culture is starting to be a little bit more understanding that you can't just assume that everyone is going to join you for a drink or everyone's going to be comfortable in that kind of, a, of an atmosphere. Yeah, and I, I, I may be wrong about this, but I don't think there's as much focus on drinking. I think it depends on the circle that you're traveling with, but I, I recently was, well, when I was meeting with publishers in New York about my new book and they were I was meeting with younger people, and they were talking about how in publishing the whole thing used to be the two martini lunch, and right, and right. that just isn't the case. I mean, people don't even have wine at lunch anymore. Um, so I think that the culture is changing. There's more of a focus on health and weight because alcohol has a lot of calories. So I think it's a bit easier than it used to be. Um, but a lot of people, you know, one of the sayings at AA, and there are a lot of useful sayings and very useful things at AA, um, is you have to change people, places, and things. I mean, if you traveled with a heavy drinking crowd, um, you may have to change that. You know, I, I mean, you know, the last thing I want to do is go spend my time at a bar. So and it's just not, it's not, you know, the, you're going to increase the odds that you'll relapse. And I think this is true for any change in someone's life, that if you want to make a change, you have to make a change. And who you associate with may be part of that, not just alcohol and drugs, right. it might be other kinds of behaviors or things that you want to change in your life um, in your life as well. If you are just joining us, this is Madness Radio, Voices and Visions from Outside Mental Health. I'm your host, Will Hall, and today 
We are speaking with Anne Fletcher. She is the author of seven books, including Sober for Good, and we're talking about recovery from alcohol and serious drinking problems. What are some of the other ways that people have um, been able to successfully uh, recover? You know, we talked about religion being important. We talked about maybe acknowledging. Um, we talked about maybe we talked about AA being important for people, but what are some of the other ways that you discovered that people have found to recover? Well, so we haven't talked about some of the other important lifestyle changes people have made. I mean, we, you know, people have learned how to manage stress. I mean, the triggers for drinking are, um, you know, depression. I mean, a lot of people have therapy in addition to quitting drinking. Um, they one of the, the one of the things that bowled me over is when I asked people how to you uh, you know you one of the big things is you got to fill that time. I mean, drinking takes a lot of you know a lot of people drank all night. Some people drank all day. Um, you know, by the way, I had was it more than more than ninety people who drank the equivalent of a fifth or more of hard liquor a day. So, you know, these weren't, I mean, I had a lot of real hardcore drinkers. So this wasn't just, you know, a lot of people who were drinking a little. Um, But I, one of the things, by the way, now I'm digressing, but I I wanted to show that I, I had people who drank everything from three to five drinks a day all the way up to people who drank, you know, like, like a, a case of beer a day or more. And we have this notion that, you know, there's every, people with a drinking problem are, you know, the hardcore alcoholic with the brown bag in the gutter. And, um, but I had people who considered themselves alcoholics or serious problem drinkers who were drinking just three to five drinks a day. And they identified themselves that way because of the problems alcohol was ha- causing in their lives. Um, and so that's where we come back to your very, one of your very first questions to me is, how do you know if you have a problem? It's not how much you drink, it's whether it's causing problems in your life and how, how it's affecting you. But anyway, um, one of the things that bowled me over was when I said, okay, you know, now that you've given up one of your greatest pleasures or your greatest pleasure, because let's face it, alcohol, even though it caused problems, was a great source of pleasure for many people, at least in the moment. And how do, you, how do you fill the time and what, how do you seek pleasure in your life? I said, what are the top three ways now that you've given up alcohol? And um, number one, the number one most frequent response was comments having to do with family and friends. You know, I enjoy my time with my wife or I got my children back and I'm so appreciative and I love my time with my family. That didn't surprise me. But number two, which really surprised me, was comments about exercise and physical activity. I, I did not expect that. I would have guessed maybe it would be in the top ten, but I, I would not have expected it to be you know, in the, it, that high up. And that really, really surprised me. Um, and so I think it's really a neglected aspect of recovery and treatment. I think some of your high-end rehabs are really focusing on things like that and yoga now. But, um, you know, we know that exercise helps people with depression, stress management, anger management. Um, so I think that's a real important aspect of recovery that could help a lot of people. What are some of the other ways that people are able to get their problem drinking under control? One of the things that really interested me was um, with my real interest in not just how do you quit, but how do you stay quit? You know, how do you stay motivated um, was, you know, how do, how do you maintain that motivation? Um, when people first quit drinking, there's there's a saying that, that sometimes, and I don't know where this came from, but there's a saying that's sometimes used, um, particularly at AA, it's called, like when you first quit drinking, after you get past the initial pain, and for people who go through detox, which is apparently very painful, um, there's kind of a euphoria, like I guess you feel like you get your life back, and people refer to it, this is the saying, I don't know where it comes from, but the, they call it the long pink cloud, and do you know where that comes comes from? No, well, I've I don't never know. heard of that. The long pink cloud. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, it's kind of like you know, it's you feel really good for a while, 
And then all of a sudden, um, you know, and I think people sometimes feel that when they first go on a diet. It's like, oh, you're really excited, you're taking charge, you're taking control, and oh, wow. And, um, and then you kind of hit this brick wall, and you're faced with the reality that, oh, you know, i got to do this forever. And even though people talk about, you know, one day at a time, I think there's this part of you in the back of your head, you know that we're talking about, you know, you're really never supposed to drink again. Or if you're losing weight, you know, I'm really supposed to keep doing this for the rest of my life because if I go back to my old ways, you know, I'm going to gain all the weight back. Um, and what I, this was interesting because I found this both with my people who've lost weight and kept it off and the people who've quit drinking. When I said, how do you stay motivated? The first response, the number one response that I got was, Different words from different people was I keep, of I keep the memory fresh, um, and again another AA saying is I keep it green. But I heard it just as often from people who didn't go to AA. I remember my last drunk. I mean these are the different words from different people. I remember what it was like. I don't ever want to go back there. And interestingly, I heard the same thing from the weight loss people. I remember what it was like when I couldn't fit in an airplane seat. I remember what it was like when my gut hung over my waistband. And people who had 20 years of sobriety or 20 years of weight maintenance would say that to me. Somehow, they keep this vivid memory um, of what their lives were like. And then, you know, you could look at that and say, oh, that's really depressing. They're just living in the past. But the second most common response, because most of them gave me more than one response, was, and let me tell you how great my life is now. So basically, they, they keep contrasting what their life was like before with how terrific their life is now. Um, let me tell you all the things I can do. Let me tell you how much fun I have with my grandchildren. Let me tell you all the books that I read. Let me tell you all the hobbies that I have now. Um, so somehow, they, I call it celebrating sobriety. They are able to do that. Now, if we could figure out how to capture that and put it in a bottle, um, and it's kind of what you're, you're probably familiar with the concept of motivational interviewing. You know, that's what they're trying to get people to do is to really focus on the cost of their behavior and contrast that with the benefits of, of what they'll get, what they'll get back if they can change. And what were some of the other things that were helpful? To- well, obviously, learning to problem solve more effectively. Um, you know, and a lot of people had therapy and counseling for that. Um, you know, if, if you're using alcohol to solve your problems for years and years on end, you haven't learned to cope very effectively. Um, so, you need, you know, pe- people talked about, you know, learning how to really deal with a problem instead of turning to the bottle. Um, they talked about, you know, some people talked about, um, I, I have a section where you talk about letting lapses not become relapses. Um, this whole idea of, you know, does, does one sip lead, have to lead you right back to the bottle? Um, and, uh, you know, that's a big message that I think a lot of people get from AA. Yes. And it's unfortunate. And I, I really personally have issues with this thing about making people start counting all over again. You know, if you have, I mean, what if somebody has five years of sobriety and they have one night of drinking? Have they lost the five years of sobriety? Absolutely not. Um, I, I have had one woman who, I don't remember the exact numbers, but it was something like this. She, I, I asked people how many years of sobriety they had. And she said, she was somebody in AA, and she said, I, had, I have nine years of sobriety, and then my husband died, and I relapsed for nine months. And, um, and now I have another, whatever it was, seven years of sobriety. So I have 16 years of sobriety minus nine months, you know, and that's the way to look at it is, you know, you don't lose, you don't have to start counting all over again. If you have a lapse or a relapse, you still have all of those years. So not seeing a, a, you know, one mistake as being the end and that's it. And then there's a kind of a defeatism of just like, oh, well, I might as well just, give it all up and, and well i indulge. think it really leads to that behavior you know it's um psychologist this is a great psychologist term there was just an article in newsweek about it um dr alan marlatt 
um, has become a good friend of mine. He was a consultant for Sober for Good, and he was just interviewed for, I, I believe it was Time Magazine. Um, I, I think he coined the term. It's called the abstinence violation effect. I call it the now I've blown it phenomenon. But it's the idea that if you, well, I've had one, so I may as well drink the whole bottle, or I've had one cookie, so I may as well eat the whole bag. That's what that kind of, you know, thinking leads people to do. Instead of saying, well, I've had one, I haven't relapsed because I've had one, I'll put the cork in the bottle now. And, you know, but telling people they've relapsed because they've had one feeds that now I've blown it phenomenon. You know what I mean? Do you think it's related to the idea of just giving up power? I know that the first step in AA, which, as we're both recognizing, works for many, many people. Yes. But, but the first step is to say, I am powerless before um, before alcohol. And that, that can, can create problems for some people to see it that way. Yes, I think it does. You know, I do have a section in the book where I talk about the paradox of powerlessness. For some people, when they accept that powerlessness, somehow it then empowers them. But for other people, I think it backfires, as you're suggesting. What do you do with situations, and, and this is a parallel, as many of our, I'm sure our listeners will realize that many of the things that we're discussing are parallel with all other kinds of issues in mental health in general. But what about the danger of um, of denial that someone is saying, hey, I don't have a problem, and and, um, you know, I am, the, I am the best judge of what my problem is, and the people around them don't agree with them. And then they start to, um, you know, say, well, you know, I, I don't have to be completely abstinent. And it actually it's not about the person figuring out what works for them. It's more about them not seeing how things aren't working. How would you sort of address that? Well, I'm not a chemical dependency expert. You know, I'm a medical journalist and I'm a weight expert. Um, so, you know, and that this is a very tough issue. I mean, I do think that there is often an element of denial, um, although, you know, what many of the expert um, articles that I read said that that often that issue of denial is overblown. I found that many of the people that I interviewed um, I believe it was most of the people I interviewed actually knew they had a drinking problem. I think the figure was about six years before they actually really seriously did something about it. So I think that, you know, part of what you have to realize is that there's a long, often a long period of time between somebody recognizing the problem and they may be owning up to you or personally doing something about it. And that's a very difficult thing. I mean, it's the same thing goes on with weight control, that, you know, you people often know they have a problem, but you can't make somebody else do something about it. Um, I don't know what the latest literature is on interventions, but when I looked at it at the time of Sober for Good, I don't, I don't think that, again, I'm, I'm not an expert on interventions. I mean, uh, you'd have to, you'd have to, you know, somebody would have to look at the liter. I'll do a literature search on interventions. But in general, my feeling, and from talking to lots of people who who have changed in both terms of weight and alcohol, is that a person has to be ready. There has to be some ele- element of willingness and readiness, or a person's not going to change. Um, there are always cases where somebody is coerced and they do change but um, beating a person into the ground and forcing people to change often does not work is this related to the idea in AA that you just have to bottom out that that's it it just has to get worse and to the bottom before you're gonna figure it out and actually that's I think one I think that's one of the greatest myths that's out there and to be honest with you it's one of the reasons I decided to tell my story in the book which I was not going to do initially um, in part because it's personal and I didn't want it in the book Um, but also because I am a journalist and I wanted to you know kind of be more of the dispassionate journalist and not have my story in there I'm glad I did tell it because I think it helps people connect with me better to know that I personally have some experience with this. But um, I'm not a person who hit bottom. Um, and I one of the most important messages I think of Sober for Good, and there's a whole chapter on this, is that you can do something about a drinking problem before it gets really bad. 
Um, we want people to do something about a drinking problem before it gets really bad. It's ridiculous to think that you have to hit bottom before you do something about it. Why would we want people to lose everything? Um, we want to teach people to recognize um, the warning signs that alcohol or any substance is causing problems in their life before it gets really serious and to help them do something about it. And that's part of what those those questions were that I read to you in the beginning. I'm interested in this idea, which I think is in, is helpful, of being a dry drunk. Have you heard of this from AA, that yes, maybe yes. you're not drinking, but you've got the same patterns, you're just using something other than alcohol, like yes. your relationships, for example? What do you think about that? You know, I had one man in the book who said, he said, yeah, I'm a crank, I'm unhappy, and I'm miserable. And yeah, but you know what? I've been sober for 20 years, so what? <laughs> you know? Uh, so what? I mean, he's, you know, he's not drinking. And I mean, you can, you can be, I don't know, what's the point? Um, I think the idea is that, you know, if you, if you quit drinking, I think part of it is, if, I might be wrong about this, but I think the the notion is that if you just quit drinking and you don't go to AA and you don't work the program, kind of you're a dry drunk. Is that kind of, Will, the impression you have? Uh, sometimes, or that you've uh, you're doing the same thing. You're just using something other than alcohol, which brings yeah, us back, yeah. I think, to the beginning, which you talked about change. Because I think that, well, maybe you get a handle on your drinking problem, and then now it's time to move on to some other problems that you've got. Maybe your gambling addiction, or maybe you've got uh, problems with your relationships, or there's um, trauma that you haven't dealt with. And so, I think it's a whole change process. It's not like alcohol yes. is the problem and then once you've solved yeah. that problem that's well i it. think that off i don't necessarily buy the concept of a dry drunk but i think that you know let's face it if you were using alcohol and alcohol was causing a lot of problems in your life you can't just take alcohol and think that oh out of your life and think that all of those other problems are going to go away and so i think that's part of where it comes from and it's important to i think you know to maintain your sobriety it's often very important to work on those other things if you want to have a quality of life that's going to help you maintain that sobriety i think that's where it comes from in large part but it doesn't have to just be through going to aa it's part of it is filling that void when you take alcohol out of your life and and learning to deal with those problems and we don't have a, a lot of um, time left, but I wanted to ask you about um, the broader kind of policy implications of your work. And you mentioned how the higher courts have ruled that A is a spiritual or religious um, organization, so it can't really be mandated in the way that it has been in the past. And I know that you're working with a, a drug court to give people who are mandated to treatment options other than 12 steps. So tell us about the kind of changes in society as a whole that you'd like to see happen as a result of your research and your insights. Well, one of the things I've been really happy to be involved in is this drug court. And actually, these people are given a choice of these are non, this is in a county in southern Minnesota. And these people are given a choice of non they're nonviolent offenders who really have addictions um, that need to be dealt with, or they're going to keep reoffending. They're often repeat offenders, and so maybe they're, they're given, drunk drivers, for example. Right, um, but they often, um, you know, are involved with 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 drugs, other kinds of drugs, you know, uh, illicit drugs, and um, they are given a choice of an intensive treatment program, weekly court appearances before a judge. Um, and basically, they're rehabilitated, you know, with um, jobs, social workers, and, you know, counseling, and um, they, um, it's, I'm on the steering committee, but initially, I was, as part of the steering committee, I helped to select the treatment program, and we set up a cognitive behavioral program that's not 12-step based, and um, they're given a choice. They're not mandated to this program, but it's it's a choice of this or jail, basically. And it's a very strict program, and if they don't abide by the rules, then they do have to go to jail, um, to prison. But basically, they, um, you know, we did not have any alternatives to AA in the community, and so drug court um, saw to it that 
Smart Recovery, a Smart Recovery self-help group was started in the town, and we now have two of them started. One of them is now being run by one of our drug court program graduates. So it's been very rewarding to, you know, see see this happening because, you know, you incarcerate these people instead of providing adequate treatment for them and, you know, they do their prison time and they come back out and they reoffend because their addiction wasn't adequately treated. Um, so it's been very rewarding to be part of that. Yeah, it raises it certainly raises a lot of issues. We've talked about the whole question of mandated treatment and the war on drugs and why some drugs are illegal and why some aren't. And it's kind of a co- complicated issue, and we don't have a lot of time to get into it. But I, I wanted to say that that's, that's really exciting work because so many people don't have an option other than AA when they're in that kind of situation. And, and so to have some choices for people, I think, is really a valuable step in the right in the right direction. Uh, tell us about the work that you're doing now. We're, we're about um, needing to wrap up the interview, but tell us about the new book that you're working on. Well, I'm, I'm writing a new book right now um, for Viking Penguin Publishers. I'm just starting the research, but I'm going to be studying drug and alcohol treatment programs, inpatient and outpatient, but mainly looking for people who recently went through treatment, who have interesting stories to tell um, about their experiences. Um, so if they'd like to contact me by email, my um, email address is my name, Anne, with an E, and M. Fletcher, F-L-E-T-C-H-E-R, at AOL.com. And do you have a website that people can find out more about your books and writings? Yes, and that's um, very similar to my email address. It's www.annmfletcher.com. Anne Fletcher, thank you so much for joining us today on Madness Radio. It was great to be with you. You've been listening to an interview with Ann Fletcher. She's the author of Sober for Good and um, six other books, including Thin for Life. Her website is annmfletcher.com, A-N-N-E-M Fletcher.com. Thanks a lot for tuning in to Madness Radio. We'll see you next week. You've been listening to Madness Radio, voices and visions from outside mental health. Madness Radio broadcasts every Tuesday, 4 to 5 p.m. Eastern, on Pacifica Affiliates WXOJLPFM, Northampton, Massachusetts, and KWMD Kasilof and Anchorage, Alaska. Co produced by peer run mental health communities Freedom Center.org and The Icarus Project.net. Madness Radio is hosted by Will Hall. Music producer is John Rice, with technical assistance from Jeremy Lansman. Listen to our internet stream, podcasts, and show archives at madnessradio.net. If you have an idea for a story or guest on Madness, radio to help get us broadcast on a station near you or if you just want to share what's in your head contact radio at madnessradio.net